And welcome to This Week Explained, the geopolitical podcast that delves deep into the world's most pressing issues. Thank you so much for joining us. And we apologize for not recording last week due to a scheduling conflict that was out of our hands. It was insane last week. Yeah. <laughs> it, was so it doesn't get better next week. No, it doesn't get better next week. But hopefully we'll be able to record. I mean, as of right now, that's still the plan. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not going to be... I'm not going to be in the middle of the desert with no connectivity. But yeah, fear not. We're back. And now we are ready to bring you all of the weekly insights and the analysis on the events and trends shaping our global landscape. And there's a lot to get to. <laughs> As always, I'm Tiana and I'm here with my co-host Carvin. And together we aim to offer you a comprehensive understanding of the complexities of our dynamic and ever-changing world. So without further ado, Carvin, let's dive into what's on your radar. for. This. Okay, Russia, Ukraine, everybody knows that. Um, also, Belarus actually was performing a military exercise and they crossed into the Polish border or crossed over onto the Polish side of the border. That was big news. The other really big event is the Niger coup. And uh, and as I speak about it, you'll hear me call it Niger, Niger. There's no rhyme or reason for why I do that, but I'll okay. do the Americanized and then... But, well, so how are we supposed to say it? Niger. I would prefer... Niger. To it Niger. Okay, yep. I would prefer to pronounce it the way it's intended to be pronounced right. not just because I'm too lazy to learn the accents <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's it's Niger and then it's uh, if you're talking about the people it's the Nigerian um, so it's yeah. it's a based so off of not, French well it's still not going to sound nearly as pretty coming out of my mouth but I'm going to give it the old college try <laughs> yeah you are you're going to be beautiful about it I know that beautiful what? It's, you're okay. a <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, so then we have a suicide bombing in Pakistan uh, that ISIS has taken credit for. Uh, we'll talk about that. Then we'll do some U.S. talks. The so U.S. and North Korea have pretty much begun their prisoner exchange talks for getting the uh, PV2 king back from North Korea. And then we'll finish up with uh, the U.S., who is the new president of the month in the U.N. Security Council. Do they change the president monthly? Yeah. So, you know, Russia's been a couple of times and then uh, China's Interesting. done. That's great. <laughs> and we'll get into all of that for sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get started. What is the latest in Ukraine? So quite a bit going on in Ukraine and actually Russia for that matter. So Russia's engaged in drone attacks on the capital city of Kiev every night this week. Uh, they don't look to be stopping that. And the drones that they're using continue to be those Iranian-made Shahid drones that Iran said they have not provided Russia, but it's clear right. that, that they're there. Now it's now there's no denying it, really. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Ukrainian Air Defense Forces said that they have been able to intercept more than a dozen of the drones, uh, but there has been some damage to like a non-residential building, and they've also said that no casualties have been reported. I've seen a lot of talk about Ukrainian grain. Has there been any deal brokered to keep that vital supply chain moving? Because we needs it. Yeah, and, and you know, if, if that gets crushed, prices keep going up and you've got inflation and then dealing with a possible recession. But let's let's go from the beginning. There had been a deal in place for months with the with Ukrainian grain, but Russia backed off from the grain deal because of attacks by by Ukraine. Um, and also Russia's been heavily bombarding Ukrainian ports and grain storage infrastructure. Like I said, that's because of attacks on Moscow that are being carried out by pro-Ukrainian forces. So it's a, a tit for tat there. Um, and this, as you alluded to, this poses a threat to global food security. So several ports in Ukraine's Odessa region have been targeted by Russian strikes resulting in damage of at least 40,000 tons of grain. And those were tons of grain that was intended for export at that moment. So it, I will say these attacks have led to uh, an increase in the global grain prices, which is not good. Well, uh, that is certainly something that we will need to keep an eye on 
as any impact to the global flu- food supply will affect everyone in the world, mm-hmm. right? Where they don't need it in their pot. Yeah, yeah well, well, it affects everybody but the rich. Right? Yeah, that's true. Oh, well, oh, okay, sorry. Well, let's instead let's get off this. That okay, yeah. Talk. Okay, I'm off. <laughs> let's talk Ukrainian counteroffensive efforts. There has been little to no news coming out about that mission. Um, is this because analysts and media sites are staying quiet so they don't give up key information about the offensive, or is it really just not that effective right now? I would say it's a little bit of both. Um, I can say that Ukraine's counteroffensive has faced obstacles, and that's because the Russians laid out extensive areas of minefields. Um, Now, these minefields have definitely slowed down Ukraine's military progress, but Ukrainian officials did say that their military is operating on their own timetable, and that's for strategic reasons. So maybe it's to like build up their like Russians confidence and then come in like shock them, like shock and awe. That is, I mean, that definitely could be. And uh, (laughs) I also saw a report that um, the Ukrainians have kind of gone away from American style war tactic. I did see that too, that they're leaving Western war tactics. Yeah, they're doing what they know best. I I would always say do that. Do what you know best, oh, yes, especially yeah. especially in war. Um so yeah, they it's Ukrainians say it's on their own timetable. Um I I think we've said this from the start that the counteroffensive was always going to take an extended amount of time. It wasn't going to be something that was going to be real quick and then Ukraine yeah. takes over. You're right. Uh but there are a ton of analysts who are worried about Ukrainians' uh, slow counteroffensive movement. Well, since there is no major update there, let's get into some of the major geopolitical stories for this week, specifically. We can start with tensions increasing along the Polish-Belarus border. Can you explain what happened? And um, then can we get into the geopolitical implications? Yeah. Uh, okay, so... Early this week, we'll start from the beginning. Two Belarusian helicopters entered Polish airspace at low altitude, and this was during training exercises. And Poland's defense ministry reported the incident to NATO, which stated that it is monitoring the situation closely and it is in contact with Polish authorities. So what has been the response to this in the region? Well, we got Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia who have begun deploying more troops and military equipment to their borders. Yeah, so that's because there's there's this concern. Uh, understandably so. That Belarus is that's what crossing. Russia, that's what Putin did. He started yep. stationing his troops all along the Ukrainian border, and they're like, no, nah, nothing's going to happen. He's yeah, like, yeah, every, everybody but us was like, it's not going to happen. Don't quit trying to say that. Um, it did. Uh, so all of those countries expressed grave concern about a potential provocation by Belarus. Mm-hmm. Um, th- this is because there's in- increased threats posed by the Wagner Group because they're staging near their respective borders. So they're in Belarus. So so those Wagner forces that were sent to Belarus have been staging at the border on top of everything else? Well, according to satellite images and open source reporting, yes. Holy moly. Also... Poland's prime minister has stated that approximately 100 Wagner forces had approached the border with Poland, specifically in the strategically sensitive area known as the Sowalki Gap. That's a, that's a main access point. So Poland believes Belarus is staging a hybrid war in an attempt to give Russia the opportunity to invade Poland. Oh, wait. You'll need to you'll need to slow down a little bit because that's a whole lot. There is a major accusation. So we need to take it one step at a time with this. Okay. So first, what is a hybrid war that is being discussed right here? Like, what what are they talking about, hybrid war? All right. So I guess we'll commit a little bit more time to this topic than I originally thought so we can break down everything. Hey, your girl needs details. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like things bare bones. <laughs> well, you make a great point because... We're not in the business of just making wild accusations unless there's evidence and analysis of it. And then that in that case, it's not a wild accusation. All right. So let's start with the hybrid war claim. Poland is accusing Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko of using the migration route between Belarus and Poland as a form of, quote, hybrid warfare. 
This was to create instability in the West. Now, this started about a month ago when Belarus offered visa-free travel to 73 countries for a music festival that Lukashenko was putting on in Belarus. So many, not just Poland, but many nearby NATO countries became very leery of the arrangement and began to publicly state their concerns that this would lead to a migrant crisis similar to the one that occurred in 2021. Uh, because of that, Poland, so because of the 2021 migrant crisis, Poland built a fence on the border with Belarus because there were tens of thousands of migrants during that time. Uh, today, Polish security guards have reported dozens of attempts to illegally cross the border daily. So how is that hybrid warfare if it's for a music festival? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what what does it have to do with Wagner forces? Yeah, so both very good questions. Uh, a lot of moving parts here. So with the okay. let's start again with the hybrid warfare. Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, all those neighboring countries see this event, that that music festival where you're allowing people from all over the world to come in visa free. So you're not really tracking who's Can coming in and out from people who might go out. Well, they they're saying that they can have a bunch of migrants from Southwest Asia or various countries with, uh, you know, that that are trying to find um trying to get out of a country that's in a conflict, can come into Belarus without any tracking. And then when the music festival's over, they can go cross right into Poland. And there could be this massive wave of migrants trying to cross into Poland. And so what, what they're saying is that Belarus is using it as a way to destabilize their countries by overwhelming them with those migrants. Oh, my so we. We've okay. seen it here in the U.S., right? We have a we have a migrant crisis in the U.S. Tons of people want to come over because they're escaping the countries that they're in. Mm -hmm. And it it definitely leads to violent clashes at the border. So if a violent clash at the border happens, that could lead Belarus and Russia to act militarily in order to, and I'll quote what they would say, is to protect the integrity of their borders. Right, right. Because they had nothing to do with it. Correct. Um Totally innocent. And so it's, all of this is just a sneaky way to get into an armed conflict and then point the finger at the other country for not doing enough. Or that's what the implication is because right. you're, you're, you kind of stated that like fact. That's what we're trying to figure out. Not not have your opinions bleed into yeah. the fact. <laughs> that is, that is uh, my opinion on, on looking at it. But you're right. That's just um, something that could happen. I'm not saying that what would happen no so um like i said they get into an armed conflict point the finger at the other country for not doing enough to secure the legitimate borders both russia and belarus could go about this two ways and so they would do it to not trigger article 5 of the nato agreement so they would point the blame at poland and say you can't trigger article 5 because poland actually did it to us and so that's where that's where the wagner forces come into play if that happens, Belarus could request support from the Wagner forces and then keep their hands clean of any military involvement because they're not a military group. Now, the other course of action would be to also to try to carry out a false flag along the border, leading to the need for actual military involvement. Uh, we are we are a ways away from any of that happening, but I do think it's something that the entire globe needs to keep a closer eye on. Is there any opposing view to the one that you just presented? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, even in more neutral analytical circles, they say that the threat is being overstated for political purposes. It's always political. Right. And there's parliamentary elections coming up in Poland. So they think people are, the politicians are trying to, to show their strength in doing right. that. Some experts have even suggested that the actual current combat power of the Wagner mercenaries in Belarus does not pose even a threat to conventional military within Poland or even Ukraine, for that matter. They believe that the level of threat will depend on future scenarios. That's things like uh, further arming of the Wagner group or orders given to the group, like actual paper orders sent out. Okay. I, I appreciate the full scope of views on that whole thing. So let's get into the other huge event that is still ongoing, and that, of course, is the coup in Niger. 
you spent plenty of time in the capital of Niamey, right? Do I remember that right? Yep. Niamey. You got it. May. Oh, I, I suddenly, like, my brain churned out. I couldn't remember if I was going to pronounce that correctly. I could see it in my brain. I could see it spelling, but I'm like, I'm going to ruin this word. <laughs> so what can you tell us about the current state of the country? And where do you see this going? And also, I do have another country country question. Does the old company you used to work for that shall remain nameless still have a headquarters there? And also, will there be a resolution soon, or could it bleed over into neighboring African countries? And I need you to get all of these in order. Uh, all right. And I have two minutes to do. Two minutes. <laughs> and then I As... get to enter a two-minute rebuttal. Yeah. Well, That's not work. Uh, I will say, first of all, I don't know if, uh, if there's still a headquarters out there. Also, um, that is not in order. I asked you another question. Well, I'm going to get through to the stuff I don't know first. Okay. Okay. Because <laughs> those are sense. quick. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. I got gotcha. you. I mean, I so there was a uh, so there was a talk about a shift from Niamey to another site in Niger where um, the U.S. had spent billions of dollars to build up an actual. It would have been the second. Trying to get this correct, the second known military U.S. military site. In Africa, and I I want to say that clearly that it's known. would be the known because there we are know that yeah everybody gets to know all the little peons get to know that yeah. it's there yes it's that. not super secret um so that is still that's in question that was being developed almost a decade ago yeah and and with all of this and we'll we'll talk about you know Russia's plan to move the U S out and all of that kind of yeah, stuff but of course I don't know what's going on with that base and okay. this so this coup throws all of that into question um, it's right. it's a huge event and i do want to say that you are so good with the segues because this is when you hear oh niger africa why are we talking about this with russia belarus just before it yeah. it's yes very much directly influenced by russia and belarus mm -hmm. so i want to start with the like the how you know, how did this start? And then we're going to get into how Russia is involved. Well, that sounds good. Let's get to chapter one of this story. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, Niger's President Bozoum, he was actually the first democratically elected leader to succeed another. So he's the second in a row democratically elected leader since its independence in 1960. What's uh, Niger's independence? Okay. It's only been independent since 1960, and he is so only the Africa as a whole. Well, yeah, well, no, <laughs> no, I need a little bit more details. I do appreciate that, so Thank no you. one is confused by this. Um, uh, if he... you're confused, you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> he was uh, seemingly a very popular president with the people because right. they overwhelmingly elected him, but looks like his presidential guards did not seem to care for him. And last week engaged in a revolution to overthrow the government. Did they give any reasons for this? They did. And I think that's where we'll get into the Russia portion of this event. Uh, but first, I want to discuss their, quote, stated concerns. And I, will, I put that in quotes because, you know, publicly, when you state something, you, you know, especially in a government position, it's not really the whole truth when you're making a public I mean, statement. It's what you're trying to... The optics, yeah, trying to push. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, there is truth to those optics or that narrative, but you've got to find that truth somewhere in the middle there. So here's what they said: They said that violent Islamist groups have gained ground by controlling territory and conducting attacks in the tri-border region, uh, which is Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. Did you? Um, did you ever go? To Mali, because I know you've been to Niger and Burkina Faso. Yeah, I um, I slipped into Mali, some would say illegally, uh, and then went right, made a you complete U turn, <laughs> and got out. I didn't mean Oops. to, guys. I'm so sorry. I'm glad that you got out of it. Yeah, and then right back to our home in Burkina Faso. Oh, okay. Um, but that you didn't was really good. get to spend any no. like meaningful time in Mali. Okay, but no. in Niger and Burkina Faso, I have trouble keeping track of because you've been to several countries, 
in Africa. I want to say 17 countries in the continent of it, Africa. It was. It, well, I, well, I so I, I have trouble like kind of remembering like what events tie to which country. Yeah, it was and... never deployed to Mali. I just so happened to be. In... You just, where you were in the area. And decided... Just in the area. I thought I'd swing by. A little quick jaunt. See how your mom and them are doing? You see how your mom and them are doing. And apparently the answer is not too well. Cause... They're not. And that's part of the concerns that uh, I'm the sorry. military has. We can get back to the what? subject. They've also, so they also, besides that, they cited worsening security situation as a reason for their uprising. Okay, Those understandable. are both Knowledge. two very true things. Uh, I don't see any lies in that. Now, at the time, so before the coup, France and the U.S. were heavily or heavily involved in the counterterrorism mission in West Africa. As you yeah, know. That's, yeah, as, <laughs> no one should be surprised. That my time in Africa was spent involved in that particular mission along all those borders. Um, so over the past dozen years, that operation between the U.S. and France has seen successes and failures. Right. Um, does the mission get bogged down by bureaucracy in the U.S. and France? In red tape, yes. Yeah, of course. Um, but I do think that the militaries in the U.S., France, Germany, U.K., you know, Western um, countries are better equipped to improve this security situation on the African continent. That's my personal opinion. Okay. Well, thank you for, you know, clarifying that. Mm -hmm. But what may confuse some of our listeners is why do any of these countries need to get, why can't we just allow the countries to secure themselves? And if these soldiers think they can do a better job, should we be involving ourselves in that? Yeah, it's, it is a great moral quandary. It's, you know, when we have factions within multiple political parties around the world that feel that way with the question that you just posed. Right. They're like, but no, live and let live. Right. I, I will say to those people that the Western world fears that terror groups gaining increased influence on the African continent could then spill over to European country. And then that would lead to a possibly attacks on European or even U.S. soil. Africa is actually not that far from some European countries, right. like parts of Italy, France, yeah. Spain, um, Greece. Greece. And there is, there's a migrant crisis because of this that is happening in those countries. Um, so that's one of the big problems. The other big part of all of this is Russia and China's involvement on the continent. We've discussed this plenty of times. China and Russia are legitimately attempting to gain influence in Africa. Uh, China's already invested billions of dollars in business on the continent, and that's to gain an upper hand in mining the mineral-rich countries there. Uh, Russia's been using the Wagner Group to obtain influence in removing Western security forces. They've been doing that successfully. Mm -hmm. Both countries have been very successful. Uh, my analysis of the situation over the last few years, I see that it does appear we are going to see Africa play a large role in a major global conflict. They already did that. Already like, played in World War II. There was, yeah. yeah. Really so we talk about it. history repeating itself, right? Oh, that yeah, that's this, true. Yeah. It's, I mean, to me, it's just so crazy. And and anybody who's a history buff or, or has any knowledge of history is looking at this and going, wait a second, we did this already. Take two. Yeah, some of the major players are as different. As far as I know, take two. I, d I don't know we'll if take, it could have happened before that. I'm not quite sure. We'll take three, but, I mean, World War One was a, a little bit different. Yeah. Because it was, you know, Russia, Germany, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so, so like I was saying, history repeating itself, we will probably see Africa involved in the next major global conflict. Now, this doesn't help anyone at all. None of this. I do hope that we see some sort of diplomatic resolution but also I've talked about things being years away from happening. This particular thing is years away. A resolution is years away from happening. Well, thank you for that breakdown. Hopefully over time everything will calm down and those countries in Africa will hopefully become more stabilized. Let's get into another destabilization effort. And that is in Pakistan, where I believe um, ISIS took credit for a suicide bombing in that country. 
What is the latest with that? Yeah, this is something you sent me at the beginning of the week. Um, so that blast targeted attendees of a rally for the religious political party Jamiat Ulima Islam of Fazel along the Pakistani border with Afghanistan. You are correct to highlight that ISIS did take responsibility for that attack. And uh, as the last time I checked, which was earlier this morning, is that over 60 people were killed in the attack. What was the intended purpose of this attack? Well, the, the regional ISIS affiliate is based in neighboring Afghanistan's Nangahar province. Um, so that's sort of, that's near northwest Pakistan. Um, they are, so that ISIS affiliate is a rival of the Afghan Taliban. Now, the Islamic State has accused Jumayat Yulima of hypocrisy for being an Islamic political group, which is supporting secular governments and the military. So that's their issue right now. Oh, okay. Um, the security situation in both Pakistan and Afghanistan has been worsening. Um, it's been worsening since the U.S. left. We've talked about that situation and, and how that all crumbled. Won't get into all of that. But because of that, other extremist groups in the region have begun using suicide attacks to target their political enemies in Pakistan. Um, so just this year, so the first half of 2023, Pakistan has experienced more than a dozen suicide attacks. Do you see any resolution to the deterioration in the country's security? It's a lot like what's going on in Africa, so time will tell. But I believe those countries need to get a lot more serious about counterterrorism in their respective countries. Um, that's difficult in an area like the one that was attacked in Pakistan, Uh because I don't know if the listeners know, but those regions are very tribal. So there isn't like a firm border in the minds of the tribes. You could have a border that cuts through tribal land. And so there's an Af you know, a tribe of the same tribe that's in Afghanistan and Pakistan as the West sees it. And they don't see a border, but they keep crossing back, back and forth. And that leads to some conflict. Um, so... I'll say I think that is where like Western nations tend to fail in trying to stabilize a region like Northwest Pakistan. We, as Westerners, we tend to see things through the lens of our own culture without understanding, you know, some of the conflict is induced by arbitrarily instituting firm borders from the West. Right, right. That, that needs to stop. Does that make any sense? No, it does make sense. Obviously, the people in the country are going to see everything differently, like border wise, like they have their own conflicts going on and they see borders differently. And we're imposing what we think their borders should be. And yep. we accuse them of crossing this border or, you know, but really in their mind, they're just like, no, I'm where I'm supposed to be. You're in the wrong spot, America. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, sometimes the West creates problems not only for the countries involved but also for their own country so let's move into an update to a previous event what is the latest in discussions between the u.s and north korea on a possible exchange for the u.s soldier that crossed the demilitarized zone in korea yes yeah, so this week north korea finally confirmed that uh, pv2 king had been taken into custody by their government at least that confirmation was internally between North Korea, the U.S., and the U.N. Um, the U.N. command, which supervises the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, had sought information on his whereabouts using its direct phone line to the North Korean army that South Korea, the U.N., and the U.S. says, North Korea doesn't pick up that phone. So they finally picked it up. They, they knew. They yeah. knew what they had, and they knew who was calling. They're like, oh, yeah. Why do you, who, I'm sorry, who are you looking for? We may or may not have this person. Uh, the UN command did say that it's not going to give more details about Pyongyang's response at the time because, quote, sassy. yeah, well, it did not want to interfere with the efforts to bring him home. So it was sassy, probably. Yeah, probably. It was a sassy response. I get him. I don't doubt it. Yeah, especially if um, Kim Jong Un's sister was the one in charge with. Oh him. man. They asked her she, how to how to respond, and she, you know, she hate. She definitely does. She she is quite angry and can get quite spicy, using a term that you use. Yeah, 
it's much kinder than some of the other terms. Yeah. <laughs> what I can right. um, so they, they didn't want to give any more information or details, but the UN command did say that uh, the North Korean army had responded to the United Nations command with regards to PV2 King. Um, and that, since they did respond to that, it makes it the first time that North Korea actually acknowledged they had Private King in custody. Now, I hate that my next statement is a quasi good news statement, but the U.S. is rapidly approaching the next presidential cycle. Some would argue we're already in that cycle. So it is in the Biden administration's best interest to quickly facilitate a release of Private King. Um, I hate it because we shouldn't need an election cycle to do the right thing. I think everybody can agree with that. Um, I, I can agree that Private King made a terrible decision, but I don't think we as a country should just forget about him and then have him suffering horrific atrocities at the hands of North Korea. Like that other man that they returned in a coma. They returned, yeah. Didn't they return him to us in a coma? And they're like, we don't know what happened to him. Exactly. <laughs> what was that? That was a couple of years ago, wasn't it? Man, what well, was 2019? I want to say it was returned, maybe. Fact check us on that. I just remember them returning a man home and he was in a coma. But yeah, anyways, I definitely agree with everything you said. Even though he will need to deal with the consequences of his actions, those consequences are a lot more reasonable in the U.S. than they could potentially be in North Korea. Correct. And with that said... We need to move to the last topic of the day. We've discussed um, since the beginning of this podcast how Russia's turn in the rotation has made things difficult for the Security Council. So does the U.S. have a plan of attack during their month at the helm, or are we just going to see pretty much the same thing, not much getting accomplished? Yeah, so as you pointed out, and we talked about at the beginning, this is a monthly appointment. Every month, a new person gets to come, or sorry, a new country. Yeah gets to head the UN Security Council. Uh, that includes Russia and China getting a month of presidency at the UN Security Council. But can the UN Security Council president even do anything tangible, or is it just, like, a title? Yeah, so it's <laughs> short answer. You ready for the short answer? It's yeah. just a title. Um, be like, I am head of the Security Council. What are you right. Doing? Now, the presidency has some responsibility for overseeing the council's work and also ensuring its smooth functioning during that designated month. This, the month of August is the U.S. month, but its power is very limited. It has some broad powers to make decisions on matters of international security. Um, that includes authorizing the use of force, imposing sanctions, and establishing peacekeeping operations, but... Even if they do that, they need a unanimous vote in order to accomplish any of that. So, like you mentioned earlier, the short answer is no, they don't really do much of anything. <laughs> right. They're going to get, you know, if China if China invades Taiwan, China's not going to vote. Belarus to... goes into Russia. I mean, Poland. Right. Belarus. Those Poland. countries are not going to vote against themselves. Um, and we, had, we did talk in the past about how they became full members, and this was post-World War II. And we were friendly with these countries because they had helped us during World War II or helped the allies during World War II. So the, um, the UN Security Council president doesn't even have veto power. Oh, wow. So, you know, if, if everybody voted to pass something and the president may be like, I don't agree with what you guys are doing at all, even though my country voted for it, they can't do anything. So it's like a figurehead thing. Definitely. Okay. Well, what the king of will England. the king? <laughs> that's true. That's so, what will be the focus of the UN president during this cycle? Like, what what are we doing with our time here? All right. Let's give a heads up. This time. Or sorry, not a heads up. Brief time. Yeah, you're right. It's only 31 days, and we're already four days into it. All right. Um. Let's just give a shout out to Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield. That's the Hello, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield. So that's the UN Security Council President for the United States. Um, definitely, she's uh, in looking at her priorities. She said first they will be addressing conflict-induced famine and food insecurity. Go back to the first topic of the day. Um, she's got a lot to do there. 
She's going to talk about the Ukrainian grain. Definitely talk about getting brokering a new deal with uh, with Russia. Um, she said that the council is going to look at ways the United Nations, uh, member states, civil society, and even the private sector can strengthen, coordinate, evaluate food security initiatives, and eliminate famine. So they're bringing in everything. All the big guns. Lockheed Martin. Uh, just kidding. They'll bring Lockheed Martin in. I've got hiccup. Um, the second area of focus is going to be the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms around the world. Go back to the first topic again, Russia, Ukraine. That's <laughs> going to definitely be part of it. Um, and then in addition to those two priorities, she said, they will continue to highlight the first thing we talk about every day, which is the devastating consequences of Russia's unprovoked full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Those are her words. Wow, she didn't even try to like sugarcoat it and do the special military operation. Nope. She also said that the, the UN Council, Security Council will have a meeting on August 24th to discuss the protection of civilians in Ukraine, most notably the children of Ukraine. Okay, well, there it is. <laughs> yeah, that's everything they want. I bet Russia didn't enjoy how openly disdainful she was towards their initiative. Well, not initiative, their full-scale invasion. Yeah, uh, they did not. But I also there's no real like statement from Russia about it because I think they're used to it by now. They know um, that every UN Security Council president not named Russia and China is going to put that as part of their agenda. Nothing, no new news on that front. They knew she was going to say that. Now, like I said earlier, the president can use their position to highlight important issues or influence the council's priorities, as well as promote dialogue among members. But in order to affect tangible change, the entire council is going to have to agree. That's not going to happen with China and Russia there. Well, thank you, Kervin. Is that all that you have for this week? That's all for me, unless you had anything you wanted well, to add. Well, I think we need to, number one, remind people of the upcoming episode of Insightful Inquiries that's coming out. Yes, so I'll be talking to Cole from Alcon Intel, um, and we're going to discuss his use of an AI chatbot as an intelligence analyst. And so I'm excited excited to release this one and you're nervous <laughs> it makes me shudder like it freaks me out but okay I, I i can't wait to hear about this and also i think we need to bring up the military influencers conference that once again is happening in october right november november oh yep i'm november keeping, like we have so much coming up at the end of the year i'm very oh, no. having a hard time keeping track of everything i actually had one of our kids write stuff down on a calendar because i need to see it like just having notifications on my phone i've gotten to the point to where if i feel it vibrate or something like i don't even pay attention to it <laughs> i need a hard copy piece of paper in my face explicitly stating dates and so welcome to 1983 and that's the way i like it I'm <laughs> old school okay i'm one of those people but yeah so the um Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. You didn't cut me off. I was rambling about my inability to make sure my time is. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, like you said, we have the, the Military Influencers Conference that we will be attending and um, I believe doing a fireside chat. Is that what it's? That's, uh, that's what I call it. It's probably a panel, but I like to call it a fireside chat because it's informal. We, by the way, we aren't doing it. Uh, I'll talk to you after Shut this episode. Up. Just kidding. Uh, I know you're kidding. <laughs> you, I know you're kidding. But, um, yeah, so that's going to be yeah. in Las Vegas, Nevada at Resort Has, World. You've already been there twice this year. Are you excited to go a third time? Uh, when was the last time we went to Vegas three times? Any Either one of us. I'm pretty sure every time I've been to Vegas, it's been once a year. Yeah, usually once a year. Yeah, I don't think I've ever gone more than once a year. You are the one who's making a run at the most frequent visits in one year. Not me. But if you are oh, yeah. in the military, yeah. or you're a veteran, or you support veterans, 
Um, I I will continue to link it into the show notes yeah. so you can get tickets to that. And don't think for a second we get any kickbacks or something by inviting you guys to the influencers conference because we don't at all. And we recognize the fact that um, it might be out of uh, the budget for some people, but just in case, we're just offering possibility if you want to come here, Carvin, talk your head off in person. (laughs) We would, if you do, and you can make it out. Let um, us know. Yeah, please let us know so we can meet up and we we would just love to talk to you. Yeah, for sure. I'm much better in informal settings. <laughs> like if things are formal, I completely lose all ability to function normally. I get so nervous and I put on my RBF and then that's the end. Of it. So don't come up in a formal setting. Like if we're at the panel, please don't talk to me. But also, when we're hanging around, yeah, we would definitely love but to have a drink with everybody if you drink or have a bite to eat. Oh, I want to eat all the food. Yes. Um, look, very much looking forward to that. So um, that's two things. Do you have anything else? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think that. I think that's it. I think that might be it. All right. Okay. Well, that's all yeah. you want to add. So. Yeah. It was a lot more than I anticipated, and I apologize, but... And if you're still listening, you are the true heroes. Yeah, if you're still listening to our gibberish, we appreciate you. But also, thank you so much for our listening, for listening, for listening to our tiny, little, humble, independent geopolitical podcast. We hope that you found it both informative and engaging. However, if you have any feedback or suggestions for future episodes, please let us know. And if you would like in-depth coverage of these stories more, follow us on Instagram at Oakland Analytics. Tiana, thank you so much. And until next week, stay safe out there.